Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. But more appropriately in this program, perhaps, will define uh, our contemporary world. My guest today is 19 years old. She's one of the few female soloists in the Indian classical instrumental tradition. She's performed at many of the music concert halls of the world with Zubin Mehta, with Jean-Pierre Rampha, and perhaps most significantly with her father, often described as the patron saint, the presiding deity, as it were, of Indian classical music, Pandit Ravi Shankar. I'm delighted to welcome Anushka. Thank you. Uh, Anushka, do you, have you felt sort of the sitar as being something genetic? Did you, uh, you know, you also play the piano and, mm -hmm. and, and, and have a sort of an interest in music, needless to say, but did, did the sitar in particular feel somehow natural to you? No, it really didn't, actually. <laughs> I think it was more the fact that it was around me and that I was hearing so much Indian music, and obviously my father was playing the sitar, that, that I went to the sitar. I don't think I would have gone to it if, you know, I'd been brought up in a different situation. What is it about that, that music that, that holds you, draws you, and, and, and keeps you with it? I think just the fact that Indian music in general has such a... A spiritual quality, aside from just the excitement and the speed and virtuosity, it really moves me as the musician and hopefully the listeners too. Mm -hmm. And I really get so much out of that, so much expression and so much feeling. It's amazing. In, in what ways does it uh, does it move you? Do you feel does it make you feel um, calmer? Do you are, are you able to work uh, with with a, with a flow of emotions? What is it sort of? If you would try and put your finger on it. I think, I think in many ways it's an outlet more than anything. Say if I'm feeling very sad or confused about something, I may not even really know what the problem is or what's going on in my life that's strange, but I can sit with an instrument and, and, and I feel like I'm expressing whatever's going on in my mind and in my heart and, and I really do feel more at peace, I think. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say that it's, it's sort of like a, a catharsis for you? Yeah, it's like a journal or something, in a way, mm -hmm. definitely. And, 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 and do you feel that the, that the sort of, um, how do I put this, uh, the, the sort of the regimentation or the, or the enormous discipline uh, that, that music uh, demands, and certainly the classical traditions, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in some way uh, restrict and inhibit this process of catharsis? No, I don't think so. I think in, in many ways it makes it even more incredible because you have to go through so much discipline and so much you know, rigorous training to get to the point where, say, you can improvise or express yourself, that I think it even makes me feel like, you know, more of an achievement when I'm able to do something like that. Mm -hmm. So how much of, of practice do you do in a, in a typical day? That's the worst question This is a public, you can ask public me. confession. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if my dad's watching this. Um, I usually do just a, a couple of hours <laughs> a day. Um, I think my dad likes me to do five or six. Um. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, uh, did you sort of um, uh, feel that this is something that that, that you would stay with the, the, the purity of the, of the classical tradition, um, with the kind of demands that it, it makes on you? Uh, in, in, in some ways, it's perhaps almost always, uh, almost more tempting to to do something like jazz. Uh, than stay with, with the rigorous lifetime of discipline uh, that, that uh, what you've sort of embarked on will involve. It's hard for me to say, really, because, I mean, obviously I don't know what I want to do in 20 years. But at this point, I, I can say I've never really felt a desire to do, say, jazz or fusion or, you know, any kind of new collaboration or anything. Because what I really love to do is play classical music, and I, I don't really see the point of doing anything else until I really feel the desire so I really don't know. <laughs> what is the moment of sort of triumph, of satisfaction, of fulfillment for you? Um, you know, sort of the everyday two hours that you do, uh, the, the performance in public, uh, the sort of, you know, the look of, of, of appreciation, adoration, endorsement, approval from on your father's face when you're performing on stage. What are some of the moments of, the peak moments of fulfillment? It, it really is those moments with my father. I mean, it doesn't matter if, we're on stage somewhere or if we're recording or if we're just, you know, practicing in our music room. But there's these moments, you know, when um, he's really inspired and he's just bam, 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 everything's coming out of him really fast and I have to, like, you know, go crazy to try and pick things up. And when I'm able to or when I 
can you know reply back with something that is what he thinks is right or good. He, he just looks up at me and gives me this sort of little smile, and his eyes just sort of glimmer, and it just it, that really kills me. <laughs> <laughs> and do you sort of feel that um, you feel nervous before a performance? Does that come up for you? No. Um, well, in a way, I'm never nervous, say, the day of the show or during the sound check or anything. Um, but there's always the standard ten minutes right before I go on where um, I'm just sort of convinced everything's wrong and I'm going to forget things and my hair is going to fall out. Just, just, just random things that, that I always get sort of tense for ten minutes. And then once I get on stage again, it's absolutely and, fine. And, you know, you've performed with, 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 with other big names, <laughs> Ruben Mehta and Shofi mm -hmm. Ramfa, and you've done some bits of concert and... and, and um, uh, how is it different performing with, with another great musician other mm -hmm. than your father? That makes me a lot more nervous, mm -hmm. honestly, because you know, whoever my father is, he is still my father, so there's that comfort level with him. But with other people, it's been very different. At, at the same time, though, they've, they've tended to be people that, say, my father's very close to or you know, has known for many, many years, so in a way they are like uncles to me. Mm -hmm. So there still is that sort of um, familiar feeling, but mm -hmm. it does make me a lot more nervous. Have you felt... Uh, to, uh, you're obviously enormously privileged as a musician to have this very special re nurturing relationship. Uh, how, how, how conscious have you felt uh, of that privilege? Is it, it is sort of a pressure, an obligation? Well, you know, I, I've had Pandit Ravi Shankar, goodness me, from the time I was virtually in the crib, uh, guiding me and, and, and inspiring me in, in, in so many ways. Uh, how, how do you handle that? I think in many ways I just sort of ignore it, honestly, because when I do think about it, it does sort of weigh down on me, oh my god, I have to do it well enough and I have to, you know, pay back because I've gotten so much from him, I need to give that. And um, the thing is, is what's really helped me is my parents have never given me that pressure. It's always come from external, maybe the media or other musicians, you, know, you have to play because you're his daughter and you have to do this. And um, my parents have always said that I should only do it if it's because I love it and if I want to do it. And um, my father would honestly be happier if I did what makes me happy. He doesn't want me to just, you know, go and sludge away playing sitar just because he taught me. And that has made it m much easier for me. You know, your father has sort of embodied um, uh, sort of the essential qualities, essential dimensions of India's um, musical traditions and has been able to reach out to the West and create this remarkable synthesis by, while retaining that essential Indianness in a sense. Uh, you have spent much of your life uh, abroad, and you're in that sense an international person. Uh, how conscious do you feel of that Indian heritage? Very conscious. I mean, just you know, from having grown up going to school in London or California, I was always you know slightly different from everybody because I was Indian, and then on top of that, because I played Indian music, and a, a big part of say my school years or my touring or everything is always about, in a way, educating people about what I do. When I'm on tour now, I'll, I try and do lectures at colleges and, and things like that. And one thing I find works is that I'm younger than most people who are out there performing. And that makes it easier for me to be able to talk to people closer to my age and explain my music, because they can relate to me as a person. They can go have dinner with me, and then I can sit and tell them about music. And um, that is something that's quite important to me. What are these elements of Indianness that you feel? <clears throat> In myself? Yes. They're hard to pinpoint, actually. Um, I don't know what it is, because I think mentally I'm probably quite Western, if anything. Um, but I think more emotionally I'm Indian. I mean, just random scenes in movies that strike a chord and I'll start so sobbing, and none of my friends will get it. They're like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and um, somehow it'll hit me. Um, really, for me, more the past of India, I think. I mean, our literature and our mythology and the culture, more than than today's India, I think. Which works, because I'm outside of India most of the time, so I can sort of keep the parts mm -hmm. of India that I love. And, um, uh, you know, going back to this aspect of, of, of performance, uh, is there anything sort of in, in particular that you do to prepare uh, for a performance? How do you um, count down to it? <clears throat> I think I usually pray, actually. Um, I don't usually pray. Uh, but I always do before a concert. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, this one shloka my, my mom taught me when I was little that I say all the time. Um, and I usually just like to sit on my own for a little bit. I mean, I usually am really social. I like to be around people. But right before a show, I want to be able to just 
sit and think even, just about anything, but just to have that quiet time to internalize. Is, is this a sort of just, just, just a shloka that you use to sort of calm the mind, or is, is, is there a, a formulated prayer that you use to say that, look, you know, yeah. well, make Help this work? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it you know, has anything to do with um, the specific situation. It's really just one of the first prayers that my mom taught me, so there's a lot of comfort for, sure, it for sure. me. When I say it, I just feel safe and feel sure, good. Sure, sure. Would you sort of describe yourself as, 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 as religious in that sense? or No, no, no I wouldn't, um, which is the weird part. I think really it's more of a comfort thing for me, because uh -huh. I, I, I don't know what I, what I feel about religion, honestly. I, uh -huh. I'm really happy that I was brought up with it, because uh -huh. you know, it did sort of form a big base for me, and, and it, I think that's really important. Also because ours ties so much to our culture, our mythology. Sure. It was really nice for me, but now... I wouldn't say I'm practicing. You know, you mentioned that you you, you weren't uh, you weren't sure what you'd be doing 20 years from mm -hmm. now. Uh, but do you have do you have a dream and, and, and ambition? Would you like to see yourself performing at Place X or uh, you know 100 albums old? <laughs> or uh, are there sort of these these markers I really that you don't. see for yourself? I um, my dreams are quite scattered. Really, I um, I would love to publish something one day. I mean, whether it's a book of poetry or a some kind of weird book. I, I love to write, so I would love to do that. Um, I want to live in Spain one day. Uh -huh. I just, I just love Spain so much. I have to live there at least for a year once. Um, as far as music goes, I really just, I don't, I don't have any specific goals. I want to keep touring because that's my favorite thing to do. I love performing, so keep doing that as much as possible. In the future, I'd love to get more involved in composition work. I mean, perhaps for a dance drama or. Um, a movie or something, you know, so just something a little different. Um, Are you at all drawn to the possibility of, uh, uh, or the prospect, or, or, or the idea of, of formally uh, studying uh, music at, at, at a university, or uh, you know, that, that kind of more academic work uh, in music? Or, or, or you, do you continue to draw your inspiration from the more intuitive processes of uh, music? I think, I think, you know, that type of grounded training is very important, but it's mm -hmm. not really what attracts me. Mm -hmm. Because even with piano, I learned in a very much a one-on-one -on -one setting. I had a mm -hmm. teacher that would come mm -hmm. home, or mm -hmm. I would go to his house. And um, so it was quite similar to the way I learned with my father. And I've never mm -hmm. had that experience of being in a school setting mm -hmm. or, you know, book by book. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't really desire that, no. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between uh, your sort of relationship between uh, a student of classical music and her guru and, and, and father, who is also a guru? Uh, in, in, in what ways has that worked? I think it was just a lot of categorizing, really. I mean, just the way I act with him when we're watching TV, for instance, will be different than when we're in the music room. And for me, because I was so young when it all started, it wasn't that difficult to mm -hmm. sort of separate the two people for me. I think for my father, it was a lot more difficult because he had to really changed the way he teaches and the way he acts because, you know, I was eight years old, nine years old, and he couldn't really be the same with me as with, um, with other students. And, you know, the fact that I grew up doing so many things as opposed to having music be my one mm -hmm. thing, that was difficult for him to accept for a while, I think. You know, wh where is she? She's acting somewhere. She's, you know, doing something else uh, instead of practicing. And um, so for him, that was quite difficult for so a while. So what ways has it been different to you as, as opposed to other students? What, how, how does he relate to other students? I think it, it, it's, it's a lot more, I wouldn't say strict, um, but leaning towards that because, I mean, obviously with me too, he'll yell at me if I, if I do something wrong. It's not like he won't. But I think with most students, it's a more purely musical relationship. And so they come to him for music. So if they practice for six hours, eight hours, or if he wants to have them practice until two in the morning, that's that's what they do. And somehow with me, that it hasn't been that way because I come home from I came home from school, you know, and then I have to do my homework, and then he could practice with me, and then I had to go do something. And so that was very difficult for him to accept that it had to work like that. And my mom was quite wonderful helping out with that. But now that I'm not in school, it's sort of more towards that type of relationship, I think, because music is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and, um, there aren't so many. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been described as a, as, as, as a protege. Uh, is, that, is that a burden for you in some ways? No, I think more the burden would be uh, that I'm sort of at the age now that people aren't going to call me a protege anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're 13, you can really do anything. And people are like, oh, she's so talented, she's <coughs> amazing, 14, 15, 16. 
And then after a while, it's like, okay, mm -hmm. you, you just have to keep um, delivering more than people expect. Mm -hmm. And in my case, the expectations are really high. So that, not really a burden. I mean, it does make me nervous sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I don't really sh you know, carry it around with me or anything. Mm -hmm. Is that in some ways make you work uh, uh, harder at your music? No, you know, I really, I don't store much by the fact that people put pressures on me or have expectations because I really was brought up to believe that I need to do it for me. And if anybody, it's going to be my father that I look to. If he's happy with what I'm doing, and if I'm happy with what I'm doing, then, then that's really enough for me. I mean, because there's always going to be so many critics and so many people that I can't please everybody. I'm not going to run around trying to make everybody love my music and everyone think I'm good enough. I, I, can't, I can't live like that. Are there sort of musicians other than your father who have inspired you and have been an influence on you in some ways? I, I wouldn't say musically, um, because you know he has been my only teacher. Um, I, I wouldn't say anyone else has influenced the way I play or the way I think about music. But you know, on Those a more that you admire, perhaps personal note, yeah, definitely Menuhin was someone I really mm -hmm. worshipped. And um, what was it about him that? that the same admired. thing that's so amazing about my father, I think. Um, on one side, they're both incredible, incredible musicians. They're really just mind-blowingly beautiful music. But they're two of the most beautiful men I've ever known. And they're just loving and caring mm -hmm. and humble and, mm -hmm. and funny. They really just both value mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my dad, whether it's the, the maid, how's she going to get home at night? You know, what's, what's going on? Just mm -hmm. things like that. They were both such beautiful people on top of being such amazing musicians. Mm -hmm. So you think it's important to be a, a good human being, to be a, a good musician? In many ways, yeah. I think you could always become really good uh, technically with practice. You can be really flashy. You can really impress people with your speed and your volume. But when it comes to that part where you really want to move the listener, I think you really have to have mm -hmm. that type of uh, beautiful connection in you. It's sort of uh, frequently held that uh, you know, to be a great artist, you, you, you need to have been through the vicissitudes of life and have experienced life and its intensity and pain. Um, do you see that happening to you or do you feel that in some ways because of the, the success of your father and, 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 and his, his, his contacts, his affluence, uh, that you have been protected uh, from that reality of the, the, you know, the, the realness of life in some ways? Um, in, in some ways, as far as... Um my life goes, I have been very sort of cushioned and my entry into music was very you know, smooth because of who my father was. So in some ways I think I always have to remember not to take that for granted that it isn't always so easy, it isn't nearly so easy for most people to get the audience or the media attention th that I've gotten just you know, by being born really. Mm -hmm. But as far as the actual music goes, I don't think that extreme sense is so applicable. I don't think you have to have starved or um, you know, walked 10 miles a day mm -hmm. to be able to really express yourself because that is something that can make you express yourself, but everyone goes through other things too. I mean, I've gone through things in my life that, that have made me feel certain ways, and, and so I've definitely had the same emotional experiences. Do you feel that uh, this, this uh, in, in, in your everyday non-musical role, uh, parts of your life, um, that, that being Pandit Ravi Shankar's daughter, that being having performed so young and having had this visibility, uh, do you carry, uh, do you feel a burden of, of, of being a young celebrity in some ways? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I went to public school in San Diego and most of the kids were very, very normal. They didn't care that I was famous. They cared whether I, I was a cool person, whether I was nice. And um, so I think maybe if I'd gone to some sort of celebrity kids' school or something, it would have given me a different sense of reality. But, mm -hmm. but that kept me very grounded. And um, no, mm -hmm. you know, sort of San Diego. You're in Spain. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of this this very international um, exposure and experience. Um, how do you relate to India when you come and spend uh, your winter months here? Uh, you know, a different universe, a different different world, a different pace. I think there's really two sides to it. On one side is the very sort of spoiled Western part of me where, you know, the, the power goes out and I'm like, oh no, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, the lack of punctuality here is quite, quite funny to me. Mm -hmm. um, 
but really, I, I come here and I, I can't put my finger on what it is. There is something that I feel here when I come back from the moment I get out of the airport that I, I've not felt anywhere. I mean, it's, it Does is it a feeling feel of, home of coming ways? home. It is a feeling of coming home. And, you know, meeting people I'm not even that close to, it feels mm -hmm. more beautiful than meeting people I'm really close to in other places. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Really seeing the way people connect to their family here mm -hmm. is something very unique. I, I find that very beautiful. Um, just how, how giving people are here, how hospitable they are, how beautiful. I really love that. Do you sort of um, see yourself and as, 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 as the years unfold um, and, and you become sort of more autonomous in that sense um, and, and you will be seen increasingly as Anushka Shankar, not just Bandit Ravi Shankar's daughter, <laughs> in one way or another. Um, uh, do, you, do, you, do you see yourself in the long term maintaining these sort of connections to India beyond the family, beyond your parents, uh, uh, something that inherently, intrinsically draws you to India? Definitely, definitely. Um, well, this is to do with my parents, but um, you know, the Ravi Shankar Center we're building, it's going to be finished pretty soon, and that's something I'm going to be involved with for the rest of my life, and that will definitely tie me to India. I'll be here being involved with the center, what is it that the center will do? Uh, quite a few things, actually. I mean, one of the main focuses is to archive my father's works. There's a huge archival area, um, documentation. Um, there's also a recording studio, an auditorium. Um, so while on one side we're sort of working with all my father's creations, the other side is really to promote other artists, um, to nurture young talent, to you know do concerts, recordings of other people, uh, lesser known you know instruments of India. Um, you know, all kinds of things like that. Have you ever felt sort of adolescent rebellion against <laughs> um, being Pandit Ravi Shankar's daughter? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, most, most young people do, or at least yeah. some facets of, um, you know, what, what, what families and, and their parents uh, represent. And not necessarily because they disagree with it or because they oppose it, but because it's a natural it's process natural. of sure. you know, sort of asserting one's autonomy I think in some ways. It's definitely something that maybe I've thought about mm -hmm. many times. Um, yeah, I don't want to do this. It's just bit of a <laughs> um, but I've never really acted on it. I, I did all my rebellion in more normal uh -huh. ways. I think uh -huh. you know, I did dri definitely drive my parents crazy for a few years. Um, and, and I got that out of my system in other ways. I mean, whether it was like wearing black lipstick or you know, cutting my hair, just just silly things like that. That. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. let me assert myself uh -huh. enough. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you mentioned sort of um, that you'd like to write a book one day. Uh, what is it about a book that, that has this fascination uh, for you? Just you know, you you, you see yourself in in, in 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 CDs and cassettes and what have you on the shelf. How would a book? Why would a book be different in that sense? I think maybe that it would be purely mine. I mean, li like we were talking about with my father, I, I can release CDs, I can, I can do all this thing, and it's all to do with music, which is what I love, but that is all to do with my father and who he is and what he's brought me up to be. And with a book, that would be something that is independent of, of anything that to do with him, really, yeah. um, because I really do love writing and I do enjoy it. And if I am ever able to you know, get published or, mm -hmm. or anything. That would be something I feel like I, I've done on my own. Mm -hmm. So what kind of things are you writing? Kind of <coughs> really bad write? poetry, mainly. <laughs> um, I don't know, lots of um, just silly things, just sort of interesting things. I, I'm pretty fascinated by my dreams, mm -hmm. and I always write those down and, and spin off on those. And um, lots of poetry, lots of... Mm -hmm. um, when I travel, just random situations. And so you just sort of write for yourself for it really so pleasure, far, like, like a diary? Yeah, I've never tried to write a story or anything okay. like that. In many ways, it's like a diary, but I'll fictionalize lots of things here and there. And I hope no one reads it thinking it's my diary, because <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh -huh. not. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do you sort of try and, and, and work uh, with your dreams? Do you try and sort of remember them, interpret oh, absolutely. them? absolutely. Oh, people get so sick of me because of my dreams. I have really vivid dreams, mm -hmm. and I remember so much of them. I, I don't know if I remember all of them, but I've easily sat there at breakfast with my parents and spent a good 45 minutes mm -hmm. telling them about my dream mm -hmm. from the night before. And they're like, okay, you know, who, you know who's going to sit here and listen to her now? Mm -hmm. you know? um, but I really, I really am fascinated by dreams. I, I love them. I really do. Well, you're sort of having um, um, a father like, like, like you do. Uh, what is it that, 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 that 
you look for or, or, or see in, in, in a man or a woman in that sense uh, that um, you, would, you would truly admire and, and, and respect. Um, what is it in a human being? What are sort of the human qualities that you would consider most valuable in another human being? In, in a serious sense, a, a sense of integrity uh, is very important, I think, um, because both my parents are people that just have never sort of crossed their own limits or their own beliefs. Um, I don't think there should be like a hard and fast golden rule for everybody, but whatever is the rule for that particular person, I think it's important that you really value it. And that really shows in your life and in your character. Um, a sense of humor, I really think, is pretty essential. I, I'm, I'm pretty bad. I, I get bored quite quickly of mm -hmm. people. And um, so the people that have stayed, my friends, are really people that are, are very intelligent, first of all. And, um, have a lot of knowledge or desire a lot, a lot of knowledge mm -hmm. and people who can make me laugh or can laugh when I make them laugh. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. To what degree do you feel conscious that, that you're a woman um, really uh, performing what has essentially been a male tradition? Has um, that come up for you? It comes up a lot because people seem to be quite fascinated mm -hmm. by it. You know, I do always get uh, questioned about it. Um, I've never really noticed as far as my music goes. Mm -hmm. Um, I've never experienced any prejudice or anything, but then again, that could be because I'm Ravi Shankar's daughter. I've been very lucky. I don't know what it would be like for any other woman. But I I'm sure it does affect my music in some way or other. Someone actually told me once that my playing was more feminine than my father's, and she couldn't really explain what she meant, so I never got to find out. And maybe she meant he was more aggressive in the way he plays. I'm not sure. Uh, but it's not really something I, I notice or, or do on purpose. Well, I'm going to try this again, but, but tell me um, if you have a, a dream, not just the dreams that you dream, but in the sense of uh, Anushka has a dream. Uh, <laughs> what is your, your dream for yourself, a, a, a vision, an aspiration for yourself, perhaps? Um, and, and I was going to say 30, 40, 50, 20 uh, to, you know, years from now. Take your pick. I think I'll pick 20 years from now. Um, uh -huh. That's the closest. Um, <laughs> I'll be 40. Uh -huh. Hopefully I won't be fat and 40, because my sisters always joked uh -huh. about uh -huh. me being fat and 40. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh -huh. um, I'll still be doing music, definitely. Indian classical music, Indian you Indian classical think? music. Uh -huh. But by then, maybe I would be doing something else uh -huh. as well. But I would never stop Indian classical music. Uh -huh. That would always be my main thing. Uh -huh. mm. The man in your life? Mm, um, someone, someone, someone funny, mm -hmm. and someone very sweet, and someone who, who can handle me being, mm -hmm. you know, a musician and traveling. I don't think that would be very easy. Mm -hmm. So I hope I find someone. Mm -hmm. um, maybe kids uh -huh. by then. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, thank you.